Okay, so let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Like I, I actually, I don't know if I said my name yet, but I'm Jennifer Boyko. I'm the manager of scientific operations with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, or CLSA for short. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar that is entitled Enhancing the CLSA Research Platform Updates on New Initiatives, Data Availability, and Data Access. Um, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that the CLSA National Coordinating Centre and McMaster University are located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee Nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. And McGill, McGill University is on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anisha. Anishinaabeg Nation. Uh, we welcome and thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territories on which peoples of the world now gather. Um, as attendees of this webinar, I encourage you to learn more and acknowledge the original inhabitants of the lands where we currently have the privilege to do our research, live and work, wherever that may be. Now on to the webinar for today, uh, again entitled Enhancing the CLSA Research Platform, Update on New Initiatives, Data Availability and Data Access. Uh, we will have Dr. Perminder Reyna and Dr. Matilda Saliba uh, uh, presenting the webinar. Dr. Reyna is a professor in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster University. He specializes in the epidemiology of aging with emphasis on developing the interdisciplinary field of geroscience to understand the processes of aging from cell to society. Dr. Reyna is a fellow at the Canadian, uh, of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. He holds a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Geroscience and the Raymond and Margaret Labarge Chair in Research and Knowledge Application for Optimal Aging. He is the scientific director of the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging, as well as the and the Labarge Center for Mobility and Aging, and is the lead principal investigator of the CLSA that we'll be talking about today. Dr. Matilda Saliba is the CLSA Data Access Officer. She coordinates the feasibility review of data and sample access applications. Uh, with the CLSA, the release of data sets to approved users, communication of data release updates, and responses to access queries from approved users and potential data access applicants. She ensures providing Canadian she ensures providing Canadian and international research community with up to date imp information on the availability, use, and access of CLSA data. Uh, she has over fifteen years experience in coordinating health research projects. And prior to joining the CLSA, she worked as the National Access Coordinator for the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow, Tomorrow's Project and Data Harmonization Manager with Maelstrom Research Group at the Research Institute of McGill University Health Centre. So that was a long introduction, but very uh, uh, important that you have the context for our presenters today. Uh, but now I have the privilege to passing it along to our presenters, and I believe Dr. Reyna will be beginning. Great, thanks very much, uh, Jennifer. And uh, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, just a review of the CLSA and then share what we have in plan for the coming years or as well as for the follow-up three to follow-up four and beyond what we plan to do in the CLSA. Next slide, please. Yeah, next, next slide. Uh, uh, Tina Wolfson from McGill and Susan Kirkland from Dalhousie University are the co-principal uh, principal investigators, uh, co-leads of the CLSA. And uh, Lauren Griffith and Cynthia Ballion on the next slide are the co-PIs of the CLSA initiative. Next slide, please. Just to remind all of you that CLSA is developed as a research platform. And the idea behind uh, CLSA is to provide researchers and policymakers a wealth of data that is relevant to aging process and aging Canadians. So the idea is to create a platform that provides evidence-based information for decision-making that leads to better health and quality of life for Canadians. Next slide. Uh, these are some of our collaborating uh, institutions right across the country. I won't go through all of them, 
but they have all been important players uh, in the CLSA right from the beginning and continue to be strong partners uh, going forward. Next. Uh, just so uh, remind all of you that just to keep this uh, terminology in mind, tracking cohort, which we call tracking cohort, it is a, a 20,000 participants randomly selected from all 10, 10 provinces and they only provide data by telephone interviews that last anywhere between 60 to 70 minutes. And these telephone interviews are repeated every three years. And then we uh, call other, other cohort comprehensive cohort, which is a cohort of 30,000 people within, living within 25 to 50 kilometer uh, radius of our data collection sites. Those are located in small cities, mid-sized cities and large cities. And these individuals are followed through in-home interviews, and then they are brought to our data collection sites to provide detailed assessments uh, on physical measures as well as uh, blood and urine samples. And when I, throughout my presentation, I will use the word tracking and comprehensive, and that's what that uh, looks like. Next slide, please. Just to remind everybody, I see there are many people who are online today who have been the users of the CLSA data. Uh, exclusion criteria is worth that they're residents in three territories, persons living on federal First Nation reserves, full-time members of the Canadian Armed Forces, individuals living in institution, and individuals who are not able to respond in English or French, and any individuals at baseline who had a cognitive impairment or other cognitive impairment to not be able to provide consent to participate in this study in a longitudinal fashion. So these are some of the people who are not part of the uh, CLSA uh, sample. Next, please. So this, is, this gives you a sense of the scope of the study. It goes from coast to coast mostly, but not to Antarctica, uh, from St. John's, Newfoundland to Halifax, Sherbrooke, all the way to Victoria. That's where our data collection sites are, the, the big green dots, and the blue dots are where all our uh, tracking uh, participants come from. Next. Again, as I mentioned, that we have 50,000 people in the CLSA. At baseline, they were between the ages of 45 and 85. Uh, tracking cohort on the left is 20,000, followed uh, on data provided by telephone interviews, and here you can see that we launched study in end of 2010, early 2011, uh, and that data collection went over for almost three, three and a half years and finished, baseline finished in 2015. And then we started the next follow-up one in 2015. Uh, follow-up two began in 2018 and, and half of the uh, sample was pre-pandemic and other half was in the middle of the pandemic. And our follow-up three that has begun now uh, started in 2021, and that uh, relates both to tracking and comprehensive samples. Uh, in addition to collecting primary data from the participants directly, both in the tracking and the comprehensive side, we also, uh, uh, with their consent, obtain uh, uh, health card numbers from uh, all the participants. And I think we have 92% uh, of the people who have given uh, consent to do the linkage with the provincial health registries. And as I mentioned before, on the comprehensive side, we also collect questionnaire that are common uh, with the tracking questionnaire. But in addition to that, we do clinical and physical assessments plus blood and urine. And blood and urine are almost provided by 94, 95% of the participants in the CLSA. And all these measures are repeated every three years, including the collection of the biological samples. And to remind that the CLSA is designed to continue till 2033, that's when our last follow-up will finish. Next slide, please. Again, just a reminder, many of you have seen this before, uh, our questionnaire-based and passive data collection in CLSA includes on the left side, health information, we have information on chronic disease and chronic disease symptoms, pain and general health, medication, supplement intake, women's health, self-reported health service use, oral health, preventive health that was only uh, administered in baseline and, and we have reintroduced that 
uh, which I'll describe later. And you can see then we have uh, post-traumatic disorder, injuries in consumer products, mobility. This is uh, how people move in their environment. And then the lifestyle related questions. And on the right side of the panel are all of our social demographic and psychosocial uh, related um, uh, questionnaires. And you can see elder abuse was originally introduced in follow-up one. Adverse childhood experience was introduced in follow-up one as well. And intimate partner violence data collection was part of the follow-up two. Both elder abuse, sorry, the follow-up one is no longer need to be administered because this was a historical information uh, we, we, are cons uh, we were collecting and inter intimate partner violence was slated to be only collected during the follow-up too. Uh, as I said, we have health card numbers to do the administrative uh, data linkages as well, and it is planned and it's in progress right now. Next slide. In addition to the primary data collection, we also have collaborated with the Canadian uh, Urban Environment Health Research Consortium that are creating um, uh, contextual environment, environmental data. And we are at postal code level or dissemination level, depending on what level of geography their data are available. Uh, we are linking those data to each and every individual in the CLSA. Uh, so far, we have uh, some of these indicators as part of the uh, CLSA database, as well as for some new ones that are coming down the pipeline. Next slide. In addition to uh, uh, the, the questionnaire or clinical assessment or, or CANU data, uh, we have already multitudes of biomarkers and omics in the CLSA. We have, uh, we do hematology at every cycle of the CLSA data collection. We do biochemistry and in follow-up one, we introduce high sensitivity troponin, uh, NT pro BNP for heart failure, uh, IL-6 and TN-alpha for inflammatory processes. Uh, we did the genotyping using UK Biobank area and all baseline participants. Uh, right now we are in process and looking at whole exon sequencing. Uh, the, the negotiations are in progress. And at baseline, we also generated EWAS data, epigenetics data on roughly 1,480 individuals. It says 1,500 here. That was our target, but we ended up doing it on 1,480. We have also done, with those data are already available, uh, metabolo um, metabolomics analysis on the baseline, 10,000 people. And we are just beginning to do metabolomics on the remaining 20,000. And we will be doing metabolomics on follow-up one, follow-up two, and follow-up three uh, blood samples as well. And we are in progress to do some proteomics analysis. We are looking at, uh, uh, we are in discussions with a group who will do it. And there are some funding challenges that we are uh, looking to sort out in relation to these uh, analyses. Next slide, please. Um, these are some of the more detailed uh, data collection, physical assessments uh, we do. Obviously, height, weight, BMI, bone density, body composition, aortic calcification, blood pressure, ECG, CIMT, pulmonary function, vision and hearing, that includes retinal imaging, performance testing, that is grip strength, a time up and go, balance, and four meter walk. And as I mentioned, blood and urine samples and, and almost a 30 minute long battery of uh, cognitive assessments uh, and I'll spend some more time as we are expanding this battery to include additional uh, domains of cognitive assessments as well. Next slide, please. In the follow-up three, we have new measures. In the questionnaires, we are adding a new measure of quality of life. We are also going to be measuring, because in the core CLSA, we measure uh, sleep, but we are adding a supplement to that questionnaire that is going to measure the chronotype, that means the timing when people sleep and how they sleep, uh, nutritional uh, chronotype, healthcare utilization, a detailed module, uh, module on sexual health that will be administered via web, uh, family history of disease that's also going to be administered by a web questionnaire on people who can complete it on web and subset of those who can't, we will collect those data through telephone interviews. 
Uh, the new physical assessments we're adding is the wearables, Actograph and, and uh, TickWatch uh, to look at the people's mobility as well as to ascertain the physical activity chronotype, uh, vision contrast sensitivity measurements, optical electronic motion capture, that is a looking at gait and uh, gait postures and biomechanics of uh, people olfactory function and body temperature. These are only in the comprehensive cohort. As I mentioned already about the biochemistry and one of the new things we have added that is done on uh, each data collection visit are some of the urine biomarkers as well using point of care device called ClinTech. We are also reintroducing measures of elder abuse and preventive health behaviors. Next slide, please. Uh, there are some other platform enhancements that are happening. This is a busy slide, and I will take you through each one of these uh, new introductions that are happening in the CLSA. You can see in 2017, we started to collect information on the people who had deceased uh, in the CLSA. I'll describe that in a minute. Then in 2020, April of 2020, when the pandemic started, we implemented a COVID-19 questionnaire study that went for almost 10 months. And at the same time, or in the middle of 2020 to middle of 2021, we launched a uh, zero prevalence study as well. And then there was a CHR funded study which started in 2020 to look at the long COVID related to brain health. That's what we call the COVID-19 um, brain health study. And in 2022, the people who are not able to, people who have cognitively or for other reasons have declined and can't provide data to us directly, uh, we have implemented a, a proxy questionnaire. And again, I'll give you a little bit more information about that in a few minutes. Another new, uh, two another new initiatives that we have started in the CLSA uh, one called memory study. Again, it started in 2022. And the other one is a healthy brain, healthy aging initiative. And both of those I will be uh, introducing to you uh, in a few minutes. Next slide, please. And uh, as I mentioned already, uh, April 2020 to December 2020, we introduced a web and telephone interviews that collected data weekly, bi-weekly, and monthly from almost 28,000 participants. And all those, there have been around 13 or 14 publications that have come out of that data. And, and we also have a uh, COVID dashboard on our website where you can go and look at some of these uh, descriptive data. As I mentioned, the COVID-19 seroprevalence study was done on around 19,000 people. We collected blood through two mechanisms, dry blood spots and venous blood samples. It was uh, difficult study, but we completed that and all the antibody results uh, are being uh, shared with the Canadian Immunity Task Force for them to pool them with uh, uh, other data sets that also collected serum, um, serum prevalence data from other populations. And soon we will have a summary presentation of the basic uh, descriptive data from the serum prevalence study on our uh, website but some of the pool data are available on the CITF website. As I mentioned that the COVID-19 brain health study was launched in summer 2021, and it is looking at impact of COVID-19 on cognition and brain health of the people who actually tested positive in the CLSA versus people who didn't. Uh, we sent people for longitudinal uh, MRIs, and we also do additional cognitive assessments on phone of the people who go for MRI visits. Next slide, please. And the more recent and exciting initiative is what we call Healthy Brains, Healthy Aging Initiative. This was funded by the Weston Family Foundation. It's a $12 million brain health initiative that is funded the uh, follow-up of around 6,000 people, uh, follow-up three and follow-up four. And hopefully if everything goes uh, right, uh, they will be able to fund the subsequent waves of data collection uh, for this initiative. And this is to understand our, uh, to enhance our understanding of the aging brain and how 
people age in a healthy fashion from a brain point of view and others don't, and what might be the precursors of that. And it includes physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep type of measure as well. And that's why some of the uh, uh, wearables uh, have been introduced. Please continue. So of the 6,000 people, 2,630 individuals will provide a brain MRI uh, at follow-up three and follow-up four. Uh, we are also collecting fecal samples from these uh, individuals, and we are adding an extra a battery of cognition in these 2,600 people, uh, and is going to be specifically focused on mash to sample visual search, paired associate learning, rapid visual information processing, and they will also be, will, they will also provide data through mobility trackers and sleep trackers. Next slide, please. And the remaining of the 6,000, that is 2,600 plus 3,370, 3,370 only provide uh, fecal samples uh, at home. They return it to the data collection site and we have the funding funding to do the metagenomics on 6,000, as well as metabolomics analysis on the, on the stool samples on all those 6,000 people. Next slide, please. Uh, in this case, we are using a EEG-based uh, tool, wearable tool called Muse, uh, that allows you to track sleep quality, duration, fragmentation, efficiency, uh, looks at the architecture using EEG approves, approved, uh, actograph that will go on the wrist. And these are all going to be in, not only administered in the uh, Healthy Brain, Healthy Aging study, but in all 30,000 uh, participants, except for the MUSE. MUSE will only be done on the, on the, on the uh, 2630 people who are participating in Healthy Brain, Healthy Aging study. Next slide. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have GPS and tri triaxial accelerometer devices, tick watch and actograph, which is worn on thigh, and measures physical activity and sedentary behavior, community mobility, such as driving. And this is going to be, these are going to be done on all 30,000 or whatever is remaining, I think on 26,000 uh, comprehensive uh, participants. Next. As I mentioned, Decedent Questionnaire was launched in 2017. Uh, it occurs three months after the participant's death or, or after learning the participant is diseased if the exact date is unknown. Letter is sent to the alternate contact and file and the Decedent interview takes approximately 20 minutes by phone or web. Next slide. Uh, details surrounding death, primary and secondary causes of death, living arrangement prior to death, cognitive and physical function at one month before death, information about the main caregiver, participants' healthcare preferences and decisions, quality of the participants' death and how they died are collected as part of this uh, interview. Next. As I also mentioned that we uh, do proxy questionnaire, we have just started to do those. Participants over 70 years of age are asked to designate a proxy decision maker and a proxy information provider. Proxy decision may act on participants' behalf if they are no longer able to make decisions for themselves about their participation. So for example, a power of attorney. And the proxy information provider answers interview questions on participants' behalf. And this tends to be someone who knows the uh, participants well. Uh, participants may change proxy decision maker or proxy information provider anytime during the study if they are capable to do so. Next slide. Uh, proxy in, uh, uh, information provider answer questions through telephone interviews. And we try to capture as much data as possible that the participant would have uh, responded to themselves. But there are some modules that are not uh, relevant through proxy, so we don't collect the, those. And this will be done going follow-up three and follow-up four as, as well and, and subsequent ways. Next slide. Uh, this is what we call a memory study. It's actually a CLSA dementia ascertainment study. It is funded by Public Health AG, Agency's Enhanced Dementia Surveillance Program. Idea is to look at uh, undiagnosed dementia in Canada. We are developing an algorithm to identify dementia cases using CLSA data. And then we want to validate this algorithm with clinical diagnosis 
And then the plan is to link the CLSA data with provincial healthcare databases to see how these two databases ascertain uh, dementia cases because uh, through the healthcare databases, it's estimated 30 to 40% of the people don't have diagnosis of dementia. So they, these, uh, these uh, databases underestimate and we are trying to provide a complementary data uh, for dementia in the country. And we are also doing analysis of known and emerging risk factors associated with dementia. And we have done a systematic review. We will map the results of the systematic review onto the CLSA data to see what is being measured and where the gaps are. And in the future, we might consider adding those risk factors to the CLSA platform. Next slide, please. Uh, algorithm is based on 600 participants with a range of cognitive ability. They go through a one hour medical assessment with a study clinician. It looks at medical history and brief cognitive test and neurocognitive examination. Identify a family member or friend for a 20 minute tele telephone interview to get their perspective uh, about the person's uh, cognitive status. Next. Oh, that's all I have to say. And these are our uh, researchers across the country who are supporting the CLSA in wide variety of uh, fashion. And the majority of these people have been with the CLSA uh, since 2001. And we continue to add new expertise uh, to our team as our uh, uh, range of activities uh, widen. Uh, now, Matilda will take over and describe uh, how the data access works and what we have available and what, what you can do to access these data as they emerge over the coming years. Matilda? Yeah, hello everyone. Sorry, I'm, uh, we have a technical problem. I'm, my camera is not working. So, and excuse my voice because I've been sick for the last two days. But I'll try my best to go over them. So for the data availability, I will go over the data that are uh, currently available for data access requests. And I will highlight those that are have been added recently or will be added soon. So for the core CLSA data, uh, we do have questionnaire data, physical assessments, blood biomarkers, genomics, uh, epigenetics, and metabolomics. So for questionnaire data, uh, there are available for requests for baseline follow-up one and recently for follow-up two. Uh, for physical assessment, they're available for baseline and follow-up one, and we expect to have those available for follow-up two uh, next summer. Uh, for hematology, we do have those for baseline and follow-up one. Um, but for chemistry, we do have it for baseline, but we will uh, have the follow-up one biochemistry data released next week. So this was, is coming soon. And for follow-up two, for bi blood biomarkers, we still don't have a definite date for release. Uh, genomics, epigenetics, and metabolomics, uh, they are all uh, currently available for baseline. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I'll go over uh, questionnaire data a bit in details because we have regrouped many uh, variable modules under this questionnaire data. Uh, so what it includes uh, under questionnaire data, we do have uh, socio sociodemographics, lifestyle and behavior, uh, labor force, physical health, psychological health, social health, and medications and cognition. So they're all under questionnaire data and the checklist. They are all available for baseline. Uh, for follow-up one, they are all available except for medications, which we expect to have them by March 2023. Uh, for follow-up two, we have released most of the variable modules under questionnaire data except for cognition and medications. So cognition, we expect to have those in summer 2023 and medications still to be determined. Uh, I will highlight the new measures we have for, for follow-up to here uh, under physical health and psychological health. So for physical health, we have uh, weight perception, resiliency scale, aortic valve stenosis, and those are available only for comprehensive cohort. And for the psychological health, uh, we do have generalized anxiety disorder, positive mental health, those two are available for both tracking and comprehensive cohort. And we have the intimate partner violence, which is only available for comprehensive cohort. And next please. So here, just an overview uh, for the, about the cognition measures. Uh, so what has been uh, available for baseline and 
follow up one and definitely you will have all this information on the website as well as in the data availability table. Next, please. Yeah, so for um, physical assessments uh, module. So here, uh, this, it lists all the physical assessments that were performed uh, uh, for the uh, uh, part, uh, CLSA participants uh, at, um, at the DCS visit. So, and this also includes the list of the uh, uh, images outcome data. So it's also like whatever outcome data from images like uh, ECG, bone density, DEXA, or the, all the data are listed here. So uh, that, uh, yeah, so that's it for physical. And those are available for baseline and follow up one. Uh, here, the, this provides an overview of the core biomarkers uh, uh, at baseline and follow-up ones. So as you can see, hematology uh, variables are available uh, almost all for baseline and follow-up one, while chemistry, um, almost all except two that are only available at follow-up one and other two at baseline. Here, the second column, the N represents uh, the number of participants at baseline. And as I mentioned before, genetics, epigenetic, metabolomics are only available at baseline. And this is the whole list, I mean, is available uh, in the data availability check, uh, date, uh, table. Uh, we are other than the core CLSA data, so we have uh, linked data and this is environmental indicators as uh, already presented. So here we, we did uh, link NU and Health Canada data sets with CLSA, so those are available at baseline. And uh, we will be releasing the follow-up one environmental indicators also next week. So those will be, become available for data request too. For follow-up two data, we still uh, don't have a date for release. Next, please. Okay, yeah, and uh, definitely images and raw data are available for data requests. So uh, we have CIMT, DEXA, ECG, retinal scans, pyrometry, tonometry, and raw cognition. So those are uh, data are available uh, uh, for request. Uh, if you want to request this data, data, you need to provide uh, detailed justification explaining uh, how these data are will uh, help to achieve proposed objectives and how they will be analyzed. So it requires a bit further uh, explanation uh, as compared to the regular data. And definitely you need to have the experience and resources to work with these data. And uh, this involves uh, additional costs and it will take more, more, more time to release those data uh, due to the extensive uh, work needed to copy and to prepare this data. So those are available currently for baseline and follow-up one and uh, uh, still to be determined for follow-up two. Next, yeah. Yeah, and uh, we have two uh, uh, COVID-19 studies where we can request data from. So those are the COVID-19 questionnaire study as well as the COVID-19 seroprevalence study, which we've recently released. I won't go over into details already, department presented those, so the, that's are available for request. Uh, and we have added a new tab uh, to our data checklist, which is mortality data. And this include the participant status as well as the, as the decedent questionnaire data. So for participant status, it's a, uh, uh, we can say uh, it's a vital and withdrawal status if a participant is alive, dead, or withdrew. And uh, the decedent questionnaire data, it's more uh, as presented, uh, it's uh, details surrounding death. So those information now, they're available for request. What have we have released already is the information collected by March 2022. So this will, we will keep updating those data. Uh, so probably it will, will update once or twice per year and we'll have more, uh, like every year, we'll have more, um, more updated information. Okay, so that was for data availability. And uh, now I'll go over the data access. Um, so I will first go over um, the approved applications we have so far. So each bar here represents a number of uh, total uh, approved application per year. And the uh, blue section represents um, the 20 applications. Uh, so, so far we have almost uh, 500 or more applications that were approved. 
in next year. Yeah, so since, to, yeah, we have 500 applications approved since 2014. Next, please. Uh, this is a table also presenting the same information, uh, which we can see we have uh, 318 researcher application approved, as well as 153 trainee applications. So almost uh, like one third of the applications are trainee applications. Okay, so now for up to apply for data access, um, there's several steps here. So step one would be request an account. Uh, step two, log in and start an application. Step three, complete the form. And step four, submit your application. So I'll go over step one. Next, please. So step one, uh, you first request an account. So the primary applicant should email the access email to request a Magnolia user account uh, and uh, provide by providing full name, institutional email and position title and institution. Um, so, and it usually takes two to three days to get in, to receive the login information. Uh, if it's a trainee application, uh, the, the supervisor, which is the primary applicant, on behalf of the trainee also needs to email the access email and request a Magnolia user account for the trainee by providing uh, their name, institutional email and program. So once you have your login credentials, you need to log in and start an application here. Uh, this is how the Magnolia uh, web page looks like. So you need to enter your username and passwords and you start your application. Just I wanna highlight for trainee application, it should be the trainee who should sign in. And once they sign in, uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah. So once they sign in, there this is what's, what looks like. It's a page with instructions and notes to the applicant. So uh, the trainee here, there's an add button on the below. Uh, uh, so where's the blue arrow? So the trainee must click the add button and start the application. So this is very important because uh, if the supervisor initiates the application, the trainee cannot be added. So it should be the trainee who initiates the project in Magnolia. And this we, we do this because we wanna ensure that the trainee uh, are provided the learning opportunity to write their own proposals. So after the, the, it will be step three, which is complete the form. So there's uh, four tabs here, uh, instructions, part one, part two, and part three. Uh, so uh, I always insist a lot, uh, I mean, you need to read carefully the instructions written here. And this is, uh, there's a, uh, it also has a links to different resources on the CLSA website. So the more you know CLSA, uh, the chances your uh, application will be accepted are higher. So. Uh, we always, uh, it's, it's, it's never enough, I mean. So uh, after reading the instructions and understanding CLSA well, uh, there is part one, which is uh, the applicant, it includes uh, different tabs, the applicant, project team, timeline, description, and scientific review and ethics. Um, and if there's part two, which is the data checklist, you select the data here in part two, and there's part three about biosamples, but it, it's not activated yet. So under part one, uh, there is the applicant uh, tab. Uh, so here, uh, the applicant information is entered here, and there is a section on the bottom for the trainee information, which I uh, I show here. So it's here. Uh, so you, as I said, the supervisor is the main applicant, and the trainee information would go here. So uh, and please make sure you specify the the fee waiver on the bottom too. Uh, next tab would be uh, it's the project team. Uh, so here, just um, uh, make sure they include all the project team members here, uh, and that, that multiple can be added here. Uh, yeah, for the description uh, tab. So here, uh, it says the proposal per se. So here, where you write your proposal. So there is a project title. Uh, keywords, lay summary, background, study objectives, study design, and data analysis. So I want to highlight uh, some points here. Like you make sure you write the lay summary in the lay language. 
make sure the objectives are clear and concise, make sure uh, you, the use of requested CLS da CLSA data is described here, and that you provided enough information to assess feasibility. So now I will go to for part two uh, in the application form. So part two, as I said, is the data checklist. So there's uh, uh, the first tab is the notes. So here, and it, uh, there's a link for the CLSA data availability table. I include here a screenshot. It's a PDF document that we always update with what is currently available for data requests. Uh, so make sure you uh, consult this before you uh, select the data. And there is a second tab here, which is that uh, you need to choose the cohort. Uh, so we, you either choose tracking or comprehensive or both. Uh, just uh, please note that there are no physical assessment or medications and biomarker data for tracking cohort. So if your project depends on those data, you need not to select tracking cohort. Uh, and there's a, there is a question on the bottom here with, uh, I mean, if uh, you need to specify if your project is related to a previous approved CLSA project. And if it's, this is the case, you provide the number of that project, but make sure if this happens, describe in the proposal, what are you adding to the previous approved project? Um, yeah, and here is uh, for the course LSA data tab. So make sure you select only the modules needed for your project. So just like whatever you need, you just select those, uh, the way, I mean, the modules as well as the waves. So if you only need baseline, you only select baseline. If you only need questionnaire data, you only select questionnaire data. Uh, make sure they are described in your proposal, whatever you select here. Uh, just I want to highlight again that cognition and medications data are included in the questionnaire data module. So those are here. If you select questionnaire data, you'll get those, uh, you'll get all. And there's, uh, the, yeah, and there's um, here uh, the images and raw data. I will uh, select only images if they're needed. So because, I mean, uh, we do get a lot of those uh, selecting images, but the only they need is the outcome, the output data. So uh, that are available in the physical assessment module. So if you select images and you need images, you need to describe how they will be achieved. Uh, uh, they will use to achieve proposed objectives and how they will be analyzed. Uh, they definitely involve uh, additional costs. And step four would be submit your application. So here it's important, even if it's a trainee application, it's the primary applicant uh, who needs to submit the application, not the trainee. So he, although the trainee will fill out all the application, the uh, primary applicants, uh, and this is to ensure that they had the, he, he, she were able to review the uh, proposal before they submit. And applications must, must be received by 5 p.m. Eastern time on the submission deadline. So here are our 2023 application deadlines. So we have January 18, April 12, July 12, and October 4. Um, go over the data access timeline in brief. Uh, so uh, after you submit, there's the review process, which are, takes around uh, 10 to 12 weeks. And after the review process, there's the agreement phase. The agreement phase, I mean, we don't have control over this uh, phase. Uh, it might take up to 12 weeks, depending on the institution. And after, there will be a data release. So the data release uh, usually takes five to seven days, um, except if there's images, I mean, it will take much longer. And uh, yeah, so you need to plan that it's uh, um, since uh, after submission, it might take around six months to receive the data. So the review process here includes uh, administrative review to ensure that the application is complete, feasibility review to ensure that the uh, data are available, requested data are available. And uh, we have the our data and sample access committee review, which is an independent committee uh, that provides scientific review and recommendations to the CLSA executive committee. And the uh, CLSA executive committee would uh, this have the final decision. The review outcomes are approved uh, includes uh, approved uh, minor revision, which would provide the uh, applicant seven days to resubmit, major revision, 21 days to resubmit, and not approved. 
here is um, uh, our data and, our data and sample access committee that currently we have the chair and 15 um, other members from different uh, academic uh, Canadian institutions as well as CLSA and CHR representatives. Okay, I will go over in brief or what are the main reasons like why we send back the application and this is important for you because I mean, uh, if we send back the application, definitely it will delay the process. And uh, if I mean, we can avoid this, that will uh, definitely help in approving more and more applications. So main reasons for manual revisions. Uh, usually writing the lay summary in a language that is not suitable for the general public. So we send back the application so they can rewrite the summary. And this is important because we post those summary uh, on our website. So it's important to ensure that they are suitable for the general public. Uh, second reason is selecting a cohort that is, does not include the data needed for the proposed project. So they, like I said before, like selecting the tracking cohort, for example, and the, and the, uh, uh, the project depends on a physical assessment, let's say, or whatever, but cohort won't, uh, uh, tracking cohort won't, don't include this information. So we send it back to remove the tracking cohort. Um, selecting data modules are not described in the proposal. Uh, so, uh, yeah, like uh, including uh, CANU data or uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, selecting those in the data checklist, but there's no mention about those data in the proposal. So do we either, we send back, they either need to justify their request or they need to remove those data from the data checklist. Um, requesting images, although only images output data are needed, and this is, uh, we send back and it, um, just we, we, need to, we tell them that it's a physical, they're including the physical assessment module and they need to remove uh, the images. So main reasons for major revisions are, uh, and this is 21 days usually, um, research objectives are not clear and concise enough. Uh, the use of requested data is not adequately described and proposed methods are not clearly described. So we provide, uh, we ask them to rewrite those. And we, uh, for rejection, we do reject some of the applications, although few, but mainly due because uh, requested data are not available at the time of submission, uh, or their failure to provide the level of detail sufficient to assess the study feasibility. Or once we send back for requested revisions, they don't apply those requested revisions, so we have to reject it. Yeah, so finally for the fees, uh, for the alphanumeric data, it is $3,000 for researchers based in Canada, and it is $5,000 for researchers based at institutions outside Canada. And uh, the gra graduate student or postdocs uh, can request a fee waiver if they're using the data only for their thesis or for their fellowship uh, project. Um, uh, it is one fee waiver per program per applicant. Um, fee waivers only apply to trainees enrolled at a Canadian institution or supported by, a Can by Canadian funds working outside Canada. Um, and definitely images and complex data would require additional fees and the fee waiver does not apply to those. Yeah, so that's it. If you have any questions, you can always email us at access at clsa escv dot ca for data and access inquiries. Great. So I think that wraps up Matilda. Thank you very much. I find your presentation is always very detailed and um, I'm sure everyone here will um, the, be able to use what you've said to improve their application and, and uh, likelihood of success. Um, Perminder was very uh, Again, savvy at answering a lot of the questions in the chat. So hopefully um, most of you have been following along in the chat box. Um, he's posted answers to most questions. I think I don't actually um, think there's any more outstanding. So if you do have any more um, questions, please write them in the Q&A box. Um, I see one did just come in about link with administrative data. 
Um, the question is, does it mean linkage with inpatient, outpatients, or emergency room databases? Yes. So it means basically the physician billing data, hospitalization data, and NACRS, National Ambulatory Care, wherever it is available or variation of that, and other potentially provincial databases that might be common to all provinces or available at some provinces, such as home care or, uh, or um, inter-I type of data. And just to, uh, just to say that we are in negotiation with provinces uh, and we are still at the stage of signing agreements. When it will happen, it's hard to know. We hope it happens in the next 12 to 24 months, but you never know because of all the privacy and confidentiality legislations that happen in provinces. Okay, um, and yeah. uh, and uh, just to add it to one question from Susan Stock, uh, uh, in relation to the labor force da data, we also have data in relation to pre-retirement and retirement, and you can go to our um, website and all the questionnaires are there and you can see through modules what's included and what's not included. Um, and what about maybe uh, either of you could answer the question, do you suggest we submit our proposals to our local REB in parallel with the CLSA or wait until we get approval? Um, I suggest you put it in as soon as you submit it to the CLSA because it will speed up the process for you getting data once all the agreements have been signed. But it varies depending on how long it takes from your institution to get approval done. Okay. Um, just a reminder, it's more it's helpful if you put questions in the Q&A box so that we don't have to monitor both the Q&A and the chat. Um, our data, we have a modified consent. I think it goes 15 years prior to the CLSA started and, and, and all going forward. So it's retrospective as a prospective linkage, at least plan. We'll see whether provinces will agree with that, but that's what we are planning to do. Bottom line is it doesn't matter what we have asked in the consent and what people have signed on their consent, it's at the end of the day, it is to be determined by the data custodians and privacy commissioners at each province, what they will allow. And I also just wanna to draw to everyone's attention in case you haven't uh, been monitoring the chat, any questions you might have about content of CLSA questionnaires or modules, um, our questionnaires from follow-up, um, all the way up to follow-up three are available on the CLSA website, as well as lots of, um, resources and tools that you can see what's included in the various modules. Um, and of course, you can also send an email to our, our esteemed data access officer to uh, help as well. Um, so we have time for a couple more questions. One, uh, another one is if chemistry for follow-up one is being released next week, should we expect the full release of biomarkers such as TNF um, alpha as well? Okay. Yes, yes, <laughs> I already typed in. All right. Right. You're so yeah. There was a question about uh, sexuality. What are we collecting under sex, sexual health? Yeah. I don't know if you responded, well, but I did. I actually posted a response that the the questions are actually going to be part of a, a web based questionnaire that we'll be administering after our uh, all our standard um, interviews at either the data collection sites or um, on caddy telephone calls, and they relate to um, importance of healthy sexuality as well as satisfaction with sexual partners. And so that questionnaire isn't posted yet, but if you want any more information, you can get in touch with us. Um, all right, well, we're wrapping, we're coming to the end and I don't see any more active questions in our Q and A. Um, so perhaps I will just go on with the uh, tail end of what we need to say in terms of our closing. Um, so again, thank you. This is always, uh, we do this webinar every year or two and we always find the participation and questions um, outstanding. Um, so thank you to our moder our, our uh, presenters as well as participants for asking all your questions. 
Um, I'd like to remind everyone that the next deadline for data access applications is January 18th of 2023. And you can visit our CLSA website under data access to review uh, what data will be available as well as the details about the application process. And now that you've had a refresher in uh, our application process, we look forward to your applications. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their anonymous survey upon exiting the Zoom session today. Um, that will come up automatically. The next CLSA web webinar will be pre pre well, presented in November by Dr. Emram Sat Satya, uh, and it will be based on his publication, Prevalence, Incidents, and Characteristics of Chronic Cough Among Adults from the CLSA, and registrations for that CLSA webinar will be posted on our website. Uh, if, if it's not already posted now, it will be posted very soon. Uh, and then if you're a, um, if you're a, a tweeter, uh, a reminder that CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. And we invite you to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCV. So that brings us to one o'clock right on the dot. So thank you again to everyone. If, there, if you had any questions that weren't responded to, uh, we will follow up via email with the responses to those questions. So. Enjoy the rest of the day and happy Halloween.